the Lenovo Legion Slim 5, 14 Ahp. Uh, buy it. It's, it's insanely good. It's everything I ever wanted from a 14-inch gaming laptop and then some. It's not perfect, mind you, but it's pretty darn unique and its price is insanely good. But even if you do want to buy it, you probably can't because AMD-based laptops like this one are still a scarce commodity and they've been... Uh, the cat. But even if you do want to buy it, you probably can't because AMD-based laptops like this one are a very scarce commodity and they've been a scarce commodity for like two years now. And it's also been this weird like phased rollout, at least in Europe. So to the best of my knowledge, this guy first became available in the Czech Republic at Alza. And then a few units showed up in Germany and I bought this one in Romania at Emag. Now I'm not Romanian, but I was willing to drive to and from Romania for many hours. You know, it, it, it was, ha, huh, it was a lot of work. And let me tell you, I do not regret it whatsoever. It's that good. Now, before we delve into the specifics, right, the, the strengths and weaknesses of this specific laptop, I feel the need to mention my burning hate towards the way laptops are reviewed these days on YouTube. It's absolutely horrendous. Like, all of these videos follow the exact same structure and pattern, and that's generally fine. But, like, if you have certain PR connections, if the video is sponsored, God forbid, like, you are incentivized, directly or indirectly, to really kind of sort of glance over certain debilitating flaws. And that's a problem. They might say it has a premium build quality, and you know, it's, it's pristinely built, oh, the craftsmanship, oh, a magnesium alloy chassis, and then you buy the damn thing, as I did, and it feels like plastic. Like, how is, how is this premium? It's not premium whatsoever. And they all follow the exact same structure, like some Cinebench, some Geekbench, some Blender, some Premiere Pro, Photoshop, I don't know, DaVinci Resolve, and so on and so forth. All of these things matter a ton, right? We all know this. Benchmarks matter, right? But you're not gonna be creating content every single day. You're not gonna be rendering or editing videos or doing any such thing every single day. The way a laptop behaves during your day-to-day -day usage for those general tasks like browsing the web and consuming content, these things matter a ton. The keyboard matters, the trackpad matters, the build quality, the screen, the hinge, the port selection the fan noise, the temperatures, like all of these things matter equally as much as the sheer performance or power of any given laptop. And when you test laptops in the exact same way within the span of like three or seven days, you kind of inadvertently miss out on certain flaws and weaknesses which often end up defining the overall user experience. And that happened with this laptop as well. I watched like four or five video reviews of this specific laptop and not one of them mentioned the very specific flaws which this laptop has. And they're not tremendous, right? But depending on your needs and preferences, they may well be deal-breaking. And now that I have uh, hopped off my soapbox, we can begin. This thing is built like a tank. I love it. The official marketing material says aluminum build. That's kind of true, but also not really, right? So like the lid is metal, the bottom as well, but the keyboard deck is made out of plastic or polycarbonate, right? Uh, the good news is that the keyboard deck feels amazing, right? It's very firm plastic. There is no gib, no flex. It's just spectacular. It's still plastic, but it's about as premium a plastic as you're gonna get. It looks premium, it feels premium. It kind of feels like a gaming MacBook Pro, if that makes sense. And that's pretty much the highest praise I can give it. Just no flex, no gib, just nothing. Like It's built like a tank. I've had zero flaws and zero defects, so like my unit has been absolutely pristine from day one. The hinge, the keyboard, and trackpad have all been absolutely spectacular. The I.O., the port selection, is one of the biggest strengths of this specific laptop, and it's so good that it can not only be used for gaming or general productivity stuff, but also for content creation. This port selection is to die for. You have everything you'll ever need. You get two USB-Cs on the left-hand side, both of which are 3.2 Gen 2, with one closer to the hinge supporting power delivery up to 140 watts. On the back, you have Lenovo's proprietary charging port, which you'll use with the included 170 watt power brick, two USB-As, also 3.2 Gen 2, and HDMI 2.1. And on the right, there's a physical webcam kill switch, an audio combo jack, and lo and behold, a full-size SD card slot. Finally! Our cries have been heard, or my cries at least. This thing is at once both a phenomenal gaming laptop and a content creator's dream machine. This 14.5-inch OLED panel is absolutely spectacular, and like, until you use an OLED panel, it's hard to really grasp and understand just how jaw-droppingly good it is. It's absolutely mind-blowing. 
The moment you see the, the deepest possible inky blacks, the contrast ratio, the saturation, the HDR performance, the response times, like it's hard if not impossible to go back to like an IPS panel. You can do it obviously, but this thing is just oh so good. 2.8K Pantone Valerie, 16 by 10, 120 hertz, 10 bit. It's to die for. Gaming, creating content, consuming content on this panel is a spectacular experience. It's also glossy. I love that. Most people don't. You know, that, you you do you, right? But if you like glossy panels, this thing is amazing. It's also supposed to be a variable refresh rate display, which it is not. Uh, you cannot enable free sync no matter what you do, no matter what mode you're in, uh, which is a bummer. This panel also gets plenty bright. When watching SDR content, you'll get around 390 nits up to 400. In HDR mode, you'll get between 520 and 550, which is perfectly fine. It's not as good or as retina burning as a thousand nits, right? But it's perfectly sufficient to sell you the effect of high dynamic range. Now this thing has an OLED panel, which means that it is susceptible to burn in. Uh, will it burn in? <laughs> I have no idea. Can it burn in? Ah, uh, yes, yes, it absolutely can. Um, the only real bummer for me is that, like, I've had ZenBooks and VivoBooks, and all of them have these, like, burn-in prevention features, like pixel shift and pixel refresh. Whether those things did anything whatsoever, I have no idea. But they gave you a sense of safety, right? Uh, the only things in the Vantage software that you get here are dimming features. So like dim the taskbar, dim the screen after a set period of time. That doesn't really sound as powerful or as specific as pixel shift or pixel refresh. Will dimming certain parts of the screen prevent burning? Technically, yes, but I like there are no guarantees. So like I personally am okay with the potential of burning if it means that I get to have a screen this amazing. You might not be, so just have that in mind. If you're like afraid of that, maybe go with a G14, a Blade 14, or any other 14-inch gaming laptop. That's pretty much it. Surprisingly fantastic, which is kind of strange because this is not a retina burning screen, but because it is an OLED panel, 500, 520 nits of peak brightness is actually sufficient, so that's definitely a plus. One thing I forgot to mention is that this laptop uses PWM to modulate and control the brightness, but unlike most OLED laptops which use PWM below the 60% threshold, this one uses it from 0 to 100%, so if you're sensitive to PWM, do not buy this laptop, please. Uh, surprisingly solid, especially for a gaming laptop. Not sensational, but like actually pretty usable. Take a look. Test one, two, test one, two. Not the best, not that bad, I guess. It adapts pretty fast, which is good. What isn't good is the fact that I'm balding. That's not good. Gaming laptops are not really known for their keyboards, but this guy is an exception. Oh my god, this keyboard is spectacular. The keys are crisp, firm, lots of key travel, just nothing to complain about whatsoever. In fact, this is the best keyboard I've used on any gaming laptop ever, which it's not a very high bar, right? But it's better than any G14, M16, Tough, Scar, Omen, Victus, Razor Blade, you name it. It's absolutely spectacular. Now, I am a content writer, copywriter by trade. I type every single day for many hours. And I could use this keyboard for as long as I live. It's, it's that good. Now, that is like a hyperbole, but it's the truth. It's phenomenal. There is a single zone white backlight, which as you can see, looks perfectly fine and is totally sufficient. Um, no RGB. To some people that will be a deal breaker to me. I uh, really couldn't care less. Uh, I find it a bit tacky and over the top and maybe a bit childish, but that's just me. Uh, just keep, keep in mind that this thing will be white for as long as you own it, so that's it. It's surprisingly well balanced, both in terms of sound and feel. Uh, it's glass, it's large and spacious, the clicks are on the louder side, but they're not crazy loud, and overall it's just a great trackpad, but like nothing spectacular, which is totally fine. 
A lot of people were also baffled by the fact that this laptop can only be specced out with up to an RTX 4060. Which is kind of weird in 2023. 14-inch uh, gaming laptops have always been known as these premium performant beasts. And a 4060, while certainly capable, is by no means a gaming behemoth, right? On the other hand, this laptop looks premium, feels premium, but it's actually competitively priced and is sort of this value champion, so a 4060 does make sense. The mobile 4060 has the exact same die as the desktop 4060, which means that it performs within spitting distance, which is to say pretty darn good. I've been playing everything at either native res or 2K, mostly maxed out with DLSS, and it's been amazing. Now, there are three different performance modes, quiet, balanced, and performance, and they cap the GPU power draw at 60, 70, and 100 watts, respectively. Now, on paper, that sounds like a tremendous difference. In actuality, though, as far as gaming goes, it doesn't really make that big a difference. By increasing the power draw from 60 to 100 watts, you'd expect that to make a pretty tangible performance difference. But in actuality, all you're getting is between 10 and 20% better performance depending on the title. More often than not, it's around 10%, which doesn't really justify the increase in power draw in higher temperatures and a lot more fan noise. You do get better 1% lows, but it's not as big a difference as you would expect. Now, this laptop, despite not having a vapor chamber or a liquid metal, is incredibly well cooled. And that holds true for all three performance profiles, which is fantastic. Fan noise, however, is a different topic. And therein lies the problem. Because the difference in fan noise between the silent and balanced profiles is tremendous. Like, subjectively speaking, going from quiet to balanced results in more than double the fan noise, which makes no sense for like 10 more watts. Um, and in the Turbo profile, oh my god, like, it's unbearably loud. It's so loud, it doesn't make sense. And so you're always left in this weird state of limbo. Because if the performance slash turbo mode is unbearably loud, and it is, and if the balanced mode gives you an insignificant boost in power, you're essentially incentivized to use this laptop only in its quiet mode, and in doing so, leave a lot of performance on the table performance you paid for, which is not cool. Like, the, the performance profiles or modes, they're really not well balanced, which sucks. I love this thing. It's an absolute speed demon. Like, even in quiet mode, it's blazingly fast. But Lenovo really needed to do a better job when it came to balancing out the power modes. Because right now, as things stand, you really have to pick and choose between great performance and almost no fan noise, or all of the fan noise imaginable and the performance you paid for. And that's just not fair. And all of that essentially leads us to two of the most interesting talking points, the value and the weaknesses. So let's start off with value. This specific model, which is essentially the most powerful SKU you can get, cost me 1,468 euros. That's insanely cheap for what this is. A 2.8K OLED panel, 32 gigs of RAM, a 4060? What? The ASUS G14, with the exact same specs in Europe, costs around a thousand euros more. So you get the exact same specs, the exact same components, for nearly double the price. Like, what's happening? Right now, as things stand, this is the best bang for the buck priced performance 14 inch gaming laptop on the market, and it's not even remotely competitive. Like, it's actually insane how much value, how much performance you're getting for that sum of money, especially in Europe. Like, in North America, the situation is slightly different because there the G14 is actually rationally priced, but in Europe, this is the value champion. Full stop. It's surprisingly well-rounded, and while it's not perfect, because of its price, it's a lot easier to glance over and forgive the few very specific flaws that it does have. So let's talk about them. Now, the way I see it, this laptop has three flaws. One objective flaw and two subjective flaws. Now, you're probably wondering what the f*** is a subjective flaw. Well, a subjective flaw is a flaw which may or may not be a deal breaker depending on, on your needs and preferences. An objective flaw is a flaw no matter what you do and what you want from a gaming laptop. So flaw number one, 
battery life. I'm getting six hours of battery life while web browsing six and a half tops, which is, uh, yeah, it is a gaming laptop, but I kind of expected more. The second subjective flaw is the fan noise. In quiet mode, this thing is insanely quiet and I love it. In balanced, it's a lot louder, like a lot, but it's not unbearably loud. It is a gaming laptop that's just, you know, it has to be loud at some point. Uh, in turbo mode, oh my god. I was benchmarking Red Dead 2 and I had to go and pee, and so I did. And I still heard the fans through two walls, two doors, and the sound of me peeing. It was insane. And it wasn't a faint sound, no, it was like audible, like what's happening, like run, something's wrong. Um, and it's made all the more bewildering once you compare it and juxtapose it to just how silent this laptop is in quiet mode. Like it's, it's like a completely different class of laptop. So if you're sensitive to fan noise, and you want to harness the full potential of this laptop, do not buy it. Like, it's, it's way too loud. And last, but certainly not least, we have the third objective flaw. I've owned over 30 laptops, not used, like, owned, personally bought with my own money. This laptop has some of the worst piece of sh speakers I've ever heard. Like, oh my god, how is it this bad? First of all, there is no bass. It's not like faint bass. No, there is no bass. No low end whatsoever. Like, no bass. And I'm like, I don't need the greatest speakers, right? Just, just give me something that's like usable and serviceable. This ain't it. Look at the mask of my boy. It's still sufficient for gaming, for podcasts, for YouTube, for music? Uh-uh. Nope. No. Just disgusting. Like, no. Just no. It's so bad, it's offensive. Like, how is this possible? Um, if you listen to music, if you like sound, um, do not buy this laptop. It's one thing to have subpar speakers, and it's another thing, another problem to have like almost no speakers at all. Like, just like, come on, Lenovo, come on, please. With that being said, this is still a unique, spectacular laptop. There is nothing quite like it. The performance, the screen, the keyboard, the port selection, the price, it's incredible. And if you buy it, you will love it. I guarantee it.